I work, I work for the Internet Archive, but I'm going to start with how I ended up there first and then go over to where we are. Um, how many people here know what the Internet Archive is? And, and, and be bold, w how many don't at all? Are like, okay, that's interesting, what is that? Okay, good, that's always nice to know. How many people have heard of me before? Couple, handful, all right. Yeah, they're the ones who are strapped in, good. And everyone else is like, who is this guy? Okay, so here we go. <sighs> um, right now, my most common title that people know me by is the Angel of Death. And the reason why is because when things are going down or stuff is being lost out there, I usually tend to either show up or be mentioned. And the way that I got to that was that when I was young, I would collect all sorts of computer bulletin board and uh, microcomputer history. And when the web came along, I put a lot of it up. So I became kind of an ersatz archivist doing it that way. And then other people said, oh, that subject is interesting. Uh, you should take some of my stuff. And I became a hoarder of other people's hoards and then eventually got brought into all sorts of cases where there were websites that needed to be saved or interesting places. And so I was kind of just kind of wandering on my own while having a, a job during the day as a computer administrator. Um, in terms of how I got to this place, okay, um, uh, there's a world out there right now where we all have these websites, okay? And so, for instance, uh, there's a place that used to be called Wanderfly. And as you know, through a lot of websites, they tend to put two words together to make it into a new fake word that then tries to take money from you. And so Wanderfly was purchased by TripAdvisor. And Wanderfly was a travel site. TripAdvisor is a travel site. It should be fine, except that very quickly afterwards, a few months afterwards, Wanderfly says, hey, great news, we're shutting down. And this keeps happening. This is a place called Ancestry.com that lets you keep track of your family history. And uh, it was, it was uh, it acquired something called 1000 Memories, which was a family history site. And then a few months later, killed it off. And this keeps happening. Places get bought and they go down. This is considered to be the normal way of living things. And it really shouldn't be. It comes because the web started out as an experiment. And when you're an experiment, you, you forgive large losses of, of this project or that project because you're going towards some sort of goal. And I say that at this point, certainly in 2015, we've achieved that goal. People get very, very edgy if there's not a Wi-Fi connection, right? A business that doesn't have some sort of internet presence in some way is either being really, really retro or bespoke or has a problem and we'll continue to have a problem. Like, that's where we are now. So we have to take this internet thing pretty seriously now and kind of hearkening back to the days of slip PPP and times when websites would go up and down because they made the Sun Microsystems computer go down. We're kind of past that, right? Um, in every single one of these, they tend to use language of happiness, right? Which is, you know, we've got this exciting new future. You don't have to read this. It just kicks exciting new future, and the rest of this can be defined as Screw you. <laughs> and in it, people say, we're on an incredible journey. In fact, there's a website that one of my contemporaries runs called Our Incredible Journey that collects these long letters in which places describe to you why your user data is now gone forever. And the smile, it's an important update. We've just been acquired. Look at the happiness of what they're going to do to your hard drive. And, and the thing is, is I, this kind of annoyed me. And I, if it's not obvious, I come from a place of energy. I don't like to just sit back and say the world is this way, we're screwed forever, and nothing's ever going to change. So I ended up kind of getting involved in these different projects of, no, 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 we got to go in, we got to go in, we got to go make some mess. Because one of the things that was obvious to me and now seems to be more and more obvious to more people is that the digital heritage is just as meaningful and is in many ways the new cultural heritage that a lot of what we do and what we believe in is put online now as the first place that it lives. You can't say, you know, uh, don't worry, you know, this is a digitization of some old family history from the 50s. You have to say, this is it. This is our family history. Uh, you know, we take photos with mobile phones that are connected to things we don't understand, that are under policies we had no role in, with no one to contact if there's any problem. It's a very scary time in that way. It, and we've kind of bought into it, and we're, buy, we're finding institutional buy-in. You know, one of the things about my speeches is that they're very dynamic because stuff is changing all the time. Now Facebook has just started a new feature to include comments on your website from them, and for them to start hosting company websites and company content on them. 
okay? So that now it's, it's no longer the place of, here's this annoying political meme, everyone gets angry at everyone else and people you thought you loved are now blocked. It's going to become this place that's trying to actually suck up most of our, uh, well, I mean, right now, Facebook is the center of all of our culture. I'm sorry. Uh, but it's the way, way it is now, right? I mean, millions and millions and millions of photographs a day are going into Facebook and nowhere else. So we're kind of living in this world, right? And more than that, people are pulling down websites faster and faster because as they kind of fall into these silos, we're seeing websites that might be around for 10, 15 years that represent the first real attempt to tell, tell knowledge and stories, and we're seeing them pulled down and, and with no way to really bring them back. Like if a person links somewhere. Now, now in the United States, our Supreme Court um, used <laughs> website links in decisions, and a person decided to ask the scary question of, and how many of those still work? And the answer is less than 50%. So if you, as a lawyer or a person who's trying to understand their rights, wants to look up what the Supreme Court was referring to, you might not be able to look at it. You know, this is, this is something that's preventable. This is something that just requires a different set of ethics and approach and a different way of looking at websites. And like I said, the first thing is to say, this stuff is vital, right? So there was a site called GeoCities. And GeoCities was a um, website where, for free, and this was 1995, for free, you could put up 10 megabytes of whatever you wanted and be given a web address that people could then use. And people loved this because it was their first, I mean, if anybody here remembers their first time running a website, right, that feeling of I've put myself up there, a presentation style of the world now could see what I'm doing anything I'm up to, and families who had stories to tell who might have never had that agency or ability suddenly found themselves with a website that they could do it. 10 megabytes is not a lot. The free bandwidth had a few caveats, but within a very short time, GeoCities became, by 1998, the number one browsed website on the internet. In uh, 1999, it was acquired by Yahoo, who then locked it in a basement and mistreated it until they finally murdered it in 2009. And it was a long, slow process to kill GeoCities. By the time Yahoo shut off GeoCities, it was still the 230th most browsed website. Like, that's what they killed, because they were like, don't need that. I know places that would literally tunnel through their siblings to get a 200 rank somewhere, but Yahoo was like, Forget about it. But more than that, they, they killed hundreds of thousands of websites. Websites that were like testimonies to the Holocaust, family histories. There were military people who had told their story and then died, and then their family didn't have the password to pull the stuff down. It was all of this history that was gone. So I assembled this team of people, right? I said there should be a team of people who should go in when websites are going down, while everyone else is arguing, is this good, is this bad, let's write think pieces. We should do something, let's go in, let's, let's pull up, let's grab all the data we can because the conversation about whether to preserve a building ends when they destroy the building. So I ended up um, getting annoyed by GeoCities and things like this. This is actually a photo website called Tableau, and I didn't get the joke until, well anyway, so Tableau, was basically upload a website, upload some pictures, and then at the bottom talk about your stuff. And this is a guy talking about uh, how his house is burning down. This is pictures of his house burning down and how he lost um, all of his pictures. And he said down here, I haven't posted in a while, my house burnt down, I lost all my memories, but at least I put up my 5,000 photos on Tableau, so I'm safe. And four months later, they deleted all his photos. Now, the only reason that you can even see these photos is because of this group that I have. Um, oh, I, sorry, one more example. But if anyone knows where we had an astronaut from space singing a David Bowie song, um, he sang it. They, are, they, they made this very interesting agreement with a licensing firm that um, um, they could have it up for one year. And then after one year, they turned it to this. And 
I wasn't, you know, a lot of people were annoyed, but the fact is, of course, is that people duplicated him singing it, and people ripped and downloaded the, the, the movie. That was easy. The hard part was the 74,802 comments that were lost with that. Now, in the meantime, there's been a hue and cry, and it's been brought back up again. But all of these are warning shots, right? So I ended up starting this activist preservationist group, which is the two weirdest words to put together ever, and it's called Archive Team. An archive team was basically whoever I could get who was interested in this idea, we would rush in whenever a website was being shut down, especially one that garnered a lot of public-facing user data. Again, not private user data, not bank data, not private photos, but where an entire presentation had been put up and then was being pulled down arbitrarily. I have seen shutdown rates as long as one year, which is what Apple did, um, to um, we're down already, to uh, we're down in one week, to the current industry standard, which is about 30 days. And so they'll say, hey, website that's been up for 15 years, we're shutting down in a month, thanks, goodbye. And there's no reason for them to provide you with data export, no reason for them to provide you. And the, the, the messages they get, the anger is so palpable. A really good example are like the really, a really, I guess you would call it vulnerable group, are young mothers. Because <laughs> when you're a young mother, you are really strapped for time. So if a service comes that allows you to take pictures of your kid and just post them somewhere, you're fine with that. That's great, take a picture, look at my baby. And everyone pretends they looked at your baby. But then what you find out later is that arbitrarily they shut down all your data. So anyway, I got really into it, created Archive Team. It's at archiveteam.org. We keep track of websites. We've been working on a whole bunch of side projects. There's something called the Archive Team Warrior. This allows people who want to help us to put something on their machine very easily. Um, if you've ever heard of SETI at home, where a bunch of computers work to look into the stars, this is essentially Archive at home. You become one of multiple machines that help us download a site and share it. We even have people on a leaderboard for who's doing the most work. You know, for instance, in this particular one, we can see Kenneth is winning. Kenneth downloaded 64 terabytes of data. This is constantly going as fast as it can. This is the person who's on this side. This is the user account they're downloading, and this is how big it is. So you can see already right here that you've got accounts that are five gigabytes. Um, over here, you can see in this particular one, uh, we had 340,000 user accounts that we were up to with 4,500 to go. Anyway, the point is, is, at that point, we ended up with something like, f I think it was like 500 terabytes of user data that was going to be deleted that we ended up grabbing. And we, of course, have these cases where we go in as a crowd and we'll start to download things and keep track of stuff. So we, we, we you know, give nerds a leaderboard and give them some kind of project. They tend to work on it pretty well. Again, we download the data and store it. Um, we have something called Archive Bot. And so the idea behind Archive Bot is that there's actually a lot of things that are going down constantly. And these are things, or, or there are things that we're worried will disappear soon, proactively. So we discovered that while it was nice to have that huge, massive canon of people downloading, a lot of times it was just somebody was running a libertarian blog. They say, I'm done with this. I'm taking it down. And it's only like 100 pages. But to talk to somebody, to talk them through downloading it, how are we going to put this in, we made a bot for it. And what this is, is about 80 to 100 people um, tell this bot, like, go download this site or download this web page. And we've been doing this one for, ooh, at least two years now, and it gets about 400 gigabytes a day. And you're like, well, what kind of things does it grab? Uh, again, this is a lot of nerd stuff to make us happy. But for instance, here, I just grabbed this last night. We're grabbing everything about Top Gear because, you know, the, one of the three hosts was just fired last night. And so they're obviously going to start pulling down any websites or anything associated with Top Gear in the BBC because nobody believes that the hosts are going to stick around, the other two. Um, so we are proactively doing this. Top Gear, kind of light. On the other hand, we also went after everything from Muammar Gaddafi's propaganda sites because when he was deposed and later died, we figured his websites aren't going to stick around much longer. And it turned out that they gave them the greatest takedown notice ever, which was, um, shut it down, or we will kill you. 
And this is very effective. So they were down within 24 hours of this takedown notice, much more effective than the DMZA in my country. And so we have all of Gaddafi's propaganda saved so that when people go, well, how bad was he, or what was he like, or what was he saying, there's a record of it. You know, the urge of a society to obliterate all of their previous history to say we have a new start can run both ways. All right, I'll keep going a little faster. So what's going on now is that people are calling me because they're like, there's a site going down, or I've got a rumor, or I work inside of a company, please do this. It's been a very good life. I'm on the outside, I'm a big, annoying pain in the butt. And that's great, that should be my entire life. But I'm extremely lucky. I work for a place called the Internet Archive, and I was hired because I was somebody who believes so strongly in saving things. And the Internet Archive, which is at archive.org, is a, is a site and a purpose and a mission and it is basically a website trying to garner the human um, corpus of knowledge, as much as can be put online, including websites, movies, music, books, magazines, and now software, which I'm also involved in. And so this site um, lives inside this building, which is ridiculous. Um, it's, a, it's a renovated um, Christian science church in, in San Francisco, um, which was purchased by my fun boss, Brewster Kale. Um, inside, nice looking building, right? Um, and it would normally look like any other church except for if you work there for three years, they give you a little statue. <laughs> There's mine. He's got little pieces of software because he really likes software. So that's what's going on with him. Um, this is my boss, Brewster Kale, who uh, had this vision. He had made many, many millions of dollars in the 1990s. And instead of doing what most millionaires would do, which is, of course, buy a boat and say, screw you all, and just head out into the sea and never come back, he said, my dream has always been to rebuild some level of the Library of Alexandria. That was his dream, which may sound crazy or not, but I think it's a much better dream than, can I fill my pool full of chocolate? Or can I make a gun that shoots caviar? You know, I mean, just all these different things he could have done. So he did this, and I'm you know, so happy that he did this. And the result of both his technical knowledge and technical background, because he was involved in something called WACE, which would do a wide area information search, and he was then involved in something called Alexa Internet, um, uh, he's got this technical knowledge. So here's three petabytes worth of data, which sits in the back of the church. And we have 21 petabytes, um, duplicated a number of times through various parts of both the church and a couple other external areas. Um, here's a machine that sits inside of our office. It records all satellite television all the time. So we have been doing that for 14 years. And so we have a lot of television. And if you go to archive.org slash TV, you can actually type in a phrase and find out what news programs have said about that phrase in the last three years up to and including seeing the actual thing being talked about. It's the most powerful thing in the world. Nobody knows about it, but what are you going to do? <laughs> we also are in the habit, in, and to a smaller degree, of ingesting things, like this is our video ingestion. You know, that's a very hard physical problem, because you want to have the, the video, and you want to make sure it's synchronized, and if there's anything involving um, you know, uh, subtitles or anything, you want to get it all. So there's an ongoing problem of ingesting physical stuff. But we're into the physical stuff. Here we are using a book scanner to scale a blind-enabled version of Playboy, which, we, which they actually make. Um, and we have a nice inbox. Um, this is one of the, the, the uh, warehouses my boss has. These are books to be scanned. So we're in that job, too. Um, so, you know, again, uh, the Internet Archive itself should be, you know, one of these places that just drives people to it to look at it. You can see this is our new design. You go in, you look at things. Um, people walk around and going like, there's no ads. There's no any. It's full of all this open content and it's full of all these crazy things. And I love it because we believe access drives preservation. Right? We believe that if you don't show people how meaningful something is, the fact that you're keeping it doesn't matter to them. People have a major problem with like, well, we have a thousand paintings. And that does, that's just a meaningless word to them. But if you give them access to some manner of that painting for them to understand it, people understand it more, they invest in it more, they want more, and they contribute more. Um, we have things like, this is just something I set up with a, um, 
uh, nightclub. Every time, every night, this nightclub records five hours of performances and puts it up on the website. But it's music. We have so much music. Same thing with video, lots of television shows. We have an online book reader, but you can also download them in all the different formats. Um, we, we try to make sure that as much stuff is available as possible. This is one of the things I'm working on now. We are making a uh, emulator that works in your browser. And so what that means is you say, oh, I used to use this computer. It has a picture of that software. You click on that software, and it just runs in your browser in JavaScript. It's a technically hard problem, but it's pretty funny. So what you have right here is Windows. This is actually running inside of a browser. And we were actually able to connect it through a virtual interface to the actual web. So this is a, um, um, this is, <laughs> let's, let's, I always get this one wrong. It's a 1995 browser running inside of a 1993 operating system running inside of a 2015 browser running inside of a 2009 operating system. And it works, except for when it doesn't. Because it turns out the web has gotten a little weirder since then. So can't just go to the White House anymore under Netscape 1.0, which but the idea here is that we're going to wire this into the many different sites we're keeping. Here's software running in a browser. And, I, and again, this stuff is meaningful to me. And the reason why is because here's a, a school that sent me, um, if you look in the back, there they are, all copies of this piece of educational software that's long since gone um, that they were able to put up with their kids and let them play this old game. You know, I don't disagree that there's like a lot out there that could go wrong and there's a lot that's going to be lost, but that doesn't stop me from trying the process of trying to get all these things. You know, it's a constant battle, and I'll happily talk with you guys today and tonight about any aspect of the projects we're working on at archive.org. Um, I am the wacky side of archive.org. We have a professional side called Archive It. We have other pieces that are doing work and partnerships with businesses, scanning into Bishan scrolls, getting old libraries, old pieces of uh, uh, um, tape and uh, audio. You know, all of that's going on. Um, it's a small group, but a very large goal. Um, I understand that life is a lossy format, like I get that, but it's not going to stop me from trying. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, I'm in this world, this is what I'm up to, right? And um, again, you know, so much of our culture is both now becoming digital and we are trying to turn as much of our culture digital to be able to take what we had before and make it instantly accessible. I believe very strongly in non-destructive preservation methods. Uh, so I think that we don't want to make the microfilm mistake again, but you definitely want to think about the fact that there are repositories out there and our, all, everything we do is open. All of our approach, our process, our technical, we love sharing our information with people. We're not in this with a brand new product promising you that you're going to go on an incredible journey with us and that we're going to be acquired by Amazon tomorrow. I think my boss would literally strap himself to the door if that happened. I could see it. I could totally see it. Um, so I've hit my 30 minutes. I could go on for four more hours. It'd be a great con, but then you'd get pretty tired. So thank you so much for your time. And again, I'll be available all today if you want to talk. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much.